I wanted to sort of continue on with something I talked about a couple of weeks ago where we looked at uh, this area of discipleship and, and what, it, what, what, what are the characteristics and qualities needed for those of us that want to grow in our relationship with God and grow in our Christian faith. I want to digress a bit from there because I've just had something on my heart this week that I want to share with you and, and uh, you know there may be some people here and I just felt like God said that uh, you know 2020 uh, dear Fred it has been a difficult year um, for many people and uh, we got the light of 2021 coming um, up the road but um, perspective is a, is a very real thing and what we look at gets magnified in our vision and if we're looking at the wrong things uh, then we're going to get wrong results in life. We're probably going to head in wrong directions and we're going to come to wrong conclusions about life. If we're looking at the right things, we can come to better conclusions, better pictures. I want to I I start by saying a few words to you and I want you to t- tell me, put your hand up if you think you can make the connection between these words. I'm going to guess Rod is probably going to make a quick connection. Here are the words. Box. Mushroom. No one yet? Fluke. Plough. Claw. No, there is a connection, Deb. Grapnel. 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 Close. Rockner. Come on, I was thinking by now I wouldn't need to keep on going with this. Someone get it. What do those things have in common? Someone, please. They are all a form of... Come on, Rod. You, you should know this. They, they should, they should know. hang on a second, just, just talk amongst yourselves. What's the connection, anyone? They are, they're all anchors, well done Rod, awesome. I love how quick that came to your attention. All those things are anchors, are anchors. And I want to talk a little bit this morning about anchors. So go with me, because I want to take this to a place. Acts chapter 27 verse 27 to 29, we're reading the story of Paul the Apostle. Paul used to be a guy called Saul, who was very anti the Christian faith. As a matter of fact, he used to grab uh, those that believed in Jesus and followers of this religion that used to be called the Way. Back in the early days in Rome, it was referred to as, as the Way. And uh, he used to grab followers of the way and he used to uh, lock them up and they were, were killed for their faith because they would not denounce the reality of what they had seen, heard and experienced. And that was the, 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 this man called Jesus that lived 2,000 years ago. See, our, our Christian faith is not based on anything other than a historical event that took place 2,000 years ago. If that moment in human history did not take place, if Jesus did not exist, and I, I don't need to just go to the Bible to see that he did. There are, there are Roman historians and ancient Greek historians and Jewish historians who did not believe that Jesus was who he said he was, who have all got written documents that verify the reality of a man called Jesus, that he lived, that he did miracles, and that he was crucified by the Romans. And then there's other evidences outside of that for the resurrection of Jesus, which I don't want to get into right now. But our faith rises and falls on whether that moment in human history happened or did not happen. It doesn't rise and fall on whether Aunt Martha was cured of cancer when I prayed for her. It doesn't rise and fall on whether you had a great experience at church when you were growing up. The Christian faith doesn't rise and fall on, on whether uh, a, a pastor or a great Christian leader is scamming the tax department or has fallen and left his wife. None of that is the rising or falling of our Christian faith. Our faith is embedded in a moment in human history. And it's a moment that we call the crucifixion. When Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who claimed to be the Son of God, hung on a cross, was crucified, buried, and three days later, rose from the dead. If that event didn't take place, then we should... Well, well, there's no point going fishing this morning. It's too windy. But if that event didn't take place, put it this way, I would not be here right now. So my faith doesn't rest on some emotion, some feeling, some answer to prayer. It rests on the fact that I believe historically that that event actually took place. And, and, and from my point of reference, my faith being rooted and grounded in that, from that place, I've then gone on to have my own experiences, my own encounters personally with this, this God that we talk about that apparently loves us. Some people think is Casper the Friendly Ghost. All right? I've had my own experiences, my own encounters that have been born out of my position and my stance of faith where I trust God and I've surrendered my life 
to that God. I've decided that, hey, I've got one life to live and I'm going to live it for myself or I'm going to live it for somebody else. I'm going to live it for my wife. I'm going to live it for my kids. I'm going to live it for, for you know, the army. Some people join the army and that becomes their family. You can live it for all kinds of things, but I've made the decision that I'm going to live my life for the God of the universe because I believe he loves me and he expressed that to me through what Jesus went through on that cross. Died on that cross. He who knew no sin became sin for us. In other words, the guy that did nothing wrong took the, pun- took the punishment on behalf of the person that did something wrong. He stepped in there and said, hey, I'll cop it. And that's the Christian story. And that's, that's what our faith is built upon, is it's built upon that moment in human history. And there's a man called Saul who used to kill believers, people who believed in Jesus and so on. He had this radical moment. You can read about it in, in this collection of 66 ancient documents. We call it a Bible. We look at it as a book. It's 66 ancient documents, uh, verified not just as by Christian people, but verified by ancient historians as actually being ancient documents that have been found verified. As a matter of fact, there are more uh, evidences for most of the books, more copies of manuscripts of most of these books than any other historical document you can find. Way by far. Way by far. And so this guy Saul has this amazing encounter where a light shines in front of him and God actually says to him, why are you doing this to me? He was doing it to the church. He was crucifying God's people, those that have put faith in him, but God took that personally. And Jesus said, why are you doing this to me? And he had this moment where his eyes were opened up and he realised there's more to this world than you can see, taste, touch, feel and smell. And God is real and God loves us and so on. So he had this radical conversion. Anyway, cut a long story short, he starts preaching this message, going around preaching to people saying, hey, this Jesus is real, this God is real. And of course, that flips the known world on its head. Those that knew him did a big mickey and went, wow, this is crazy. This guy who was once killing people is now going out there, putting himself in harm's way, and he's now preaching a message that could cost him his life and in the end eventually did. So at this point in time, Paul is on a boat. He's been taken captive and he's been taken to Rome to stand before the governors of Rome. Rome was the the superpower of the day. That was the nation that was in control at the time when Jesus came into the world. And here's here's what happens. We pick up this story as, as Paul's on this boat and he's sailing towards Rome and there's a massive big storm that kicks up and the boat's getting battered and the boat's getting tossed to and fro and so on. And it says in verse 27 of chapter 27, it says, On the 14th night, in other words, this had been going on for a very, very long time. Anyone, anyone feel like they've sort of been facing a bit of a storm, a trial, stuff's been going on, and it just seems like it's just going on forever. It's not letting up. It's not just a moment. It just seems to drag on and on and on, and you think you're coming out of it. You think you're seeing daylight, but then the clouds cover back over again. The rain comes down again. A little bit like that movie, The Perfect Storm. Anyone seen that movie, The Perfect Storm, and that final scene where they've got the boat and they, go, they turn it around and boat rolls and lands back up and he's going in the other direction and they think yes we've made it we're safe we're alive and then all of a sudden they look up and all of a sudden the storm's now coming from another direction and before you know it this massive big wave grabs them and they thought for a moment there was a glimmer of hope the the clouds parted the light shone through but then uh -uh, you're not out of it yet anyone ever feel like that in life you think you're through it you think you've seen a breakthrough and then bang the next wave comes at you and the next wave well that's what's going on here 14 days These guys are are fighting against the elements. It says, On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea. When about midnight, the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took soundings. So they dropped this thing down into the water. They took soundings and they found that the water was 120 feet deep. The wind keeps going and they keep getting battered and they keep getting pushed along. And then it says, A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was 90 feet. Fearing that they would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors. So here they are, they're floating along in the ocean and the winds are coming and they're being blown and they do a sounding and it's shallow, which means this boat could run aground. They do another sounding a little while later. Guess what? It's getting even more shallow. It means we're getting closer to danger, closer to a shipwreck. And so what do they do in order to avoid the shipwreck? It says that they drop their anchor. They drop their anchor. And I guess I'm not big for titles of messages, but if I was going to title what I want to talk about now, I I would title it this way. I think it's time to drop your anchor. It's time to drop your anchor. Anyone ever been out on a boat in the middle of a storm, in a difficult time? Anyone been out in the water? Okay, anybody else been out in a boat in a storm? It's true, my wife was out in the boat, and I'm here to confess a little bit of something to you. I took her on that boat in the middle of that storm, and uh, yes, I am to blame for a part of it okay don't exaggerate Jackie it was okay we went out there 
to the Solomon Islands. We were doing a, a trip to the islands. I was working with another church and I was going over there to organise a, a, a bit of an itinerary to take some young people over to the Solomon Islands. So I said to Jackie on this particular time, who had never been to the islands, I'd been there seven, eight, nine times. I said, why don't you come with me? All we're going to do is we're going to land. We're going to get on a boat. We're going to go from uh, the island of Guadalcanal across to Malaita. We'll get out at Malaita. I'll organise what needs to be done. We'll get on a boat. We just sail back across. It's only a three-hour trip, and it's through the island. It's not too bad. Three hours. We'll be back. We'll get on a plane. We'll fly home and, 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 and so on. And so she says, yes. So we get over there. We land. I put Jackie in the hotel room, and I said to Jackie, you wait here. I'm going to go down to the docks, and I'm going to find a boat, because that's what you do there. I just would go down there, find any sort of boat that was going to, to the islands, pay them a couple of dollars, and sit there with the chickens and the goats or whatever was on the boat, and we would just chuff across. So I went down there and found a boat, and the guy said, yes, we're leaving at midnight. So I said, fantastic. Went back, grabbed Jackie, said, quick, have a shower. We're going to pack our bag, quick nap. We're going to go down. We get down there at midnight. We jump on this boat. And we're sitting on the boat and there's big barrels of petrol that they're taking across to, uh, to Malaita. There's, I think there might have been some chickens and, and, and animals and a few bags of food and stuff they took across to the island. And uh, there was a, a few other people from Guadalcanal who were making the trip across, mothers with their children and so on, plus the crew of the boat. So we get out there and we start going <coughs> out and for about the first half hour it's nice smooth sailing and then all of a sudden the boat just starts going sort of like this, just this gentle up and down, up and down. And then in the space of about 20 minutes, it went from this gentle up and down to this really big up and down, plus it's going side to side. And oh, before you know it, we're bang in the middle of this storm. Now, what we didn't know is we were the last plane out of Australia in that direction. They closed down all flights there because of a massive cyclone that came through. We just got off the ground when they said, no more planes, you can't fly over there. So we've literally just landed there as this cyclone has hit. We're out in the middle of this ocean and we're being tossed. So of course, being the husband that I am, loving my wife, trying to take care of her, I said to her, I said, Jackie, I could see she was panicking by the fact that I couldn't see her fingers from that far. The rest was in the wood. She was sitting on this thing and all I could see was about that third knuckle out. And so I remember saying to her, it's okay, Jackie, because you know what? Uh, modern shipbuilders have taken their method of ship building from Noah in the Old Testament when Noah made the ark. What was I thinking? I said, Jackie, it's okay because Noah, Noah came up with shipbuilding and so God gave him those so the boats are safe, you know. And, uh, you know, we're not taking in, uh, of course, that didn't work, the Noah thing, so she's sitting there and getting a bit mad. So then I said to her, the, the next one was, look, we don't have to worry too much about it because the guys that are piloting the boat, they're not panicking. Now, when the pilots and that, when they start panicking, yeah, but look, they're not panicking. No sooner did I say that than they started running around. They joined, come on deck with us. They're running around. They're, 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 they're gibbering off in pigeon and everything like that. The, the petrol uh, barrels start sliding from one side, bang, up against the side of the boat, and then bang up against the other. And they're desperately trying to tie them up so we don't blow up. And, and so I thought, that's strike two. How many of you know you only get three strikes and it's out? So I'm thinking hard, I'm thinking hard, okay, what's the next one? I can tell she's really panicking, she's not liking me right now. What can I say? So in a moment, I leant up against the back of the boat like this, braced my hands and my feet, and I said, Jackie, it's actually not that bad. We're not taking in water yet. And literally as I said that, this wave jacked up behind me, hit me in the back of the head, knocked me over onto the floor and came into the boat and I gave up at that point and said, God, she's all yours. <laughs> There's nothing I can do. We made it, and here we are. Here we are, praise God. <laughs> if you've ever been out in, 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 in a storm, and so what they ended up doing was they, they, had, they had no anchors on the boat. So what they did is they had to actually, uh, what was meant to be a three-hour trip ended up taking about nine hours because they had to find some tiny little island and sort of get in behind some little island, and, and we just sat there in, in this little bay uh, waiting for the storm to pass and of course the sun came up the next morning and the storm started to subside and we eventually made it and then when we got there to Malaita we got up on the edge of the boat and we walked over to the edge of the boat and we're just kind of standing there because it's beautiful country it's beautiful land you sail into the harbour and it's just beautiful the, 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 the huts and stuff and we're standing there and I look over the edge of the water and what do I see come out from under the boat a shark it's just was not a good trip it was one to forget but anyway we made it through we made it through I had a point to that story. Or was someone just egging me on to share that story because I said something? Yeah, it was Leslie, okay. Anyway, point is this. <laughs> if you find yourself in a storm, as so many boatsmen have, I was doing some research this week about uh, nautical stuff and boats and so on. And do you know that they, they said the most underrated uh, part of a boat, the most underrated uh, piece of equipment that they have on a boat is an anchor. 
And most people don't realise the importance of an anchor until they get into a storm. Until they get into a storm and then they go, geez, I wish I had an anchor. Because when you drop that anchor, that anchor does a couple of things for you. Anchors do a few things for boats and they do a few things for us in life. Number one, uh, anchors can keep us safe. Anchors keep you safe. In this particular situation, this boat that they were on, it was drifting closer and closer to the shore. It was eventually going to run aground. The boat was going to shatter. And so it says there that they dropped anchors to hold them in a particular position to keep them safe. So they didn't continue to drift closer and closer to the shore and eventually end up a shipwreck. The second thing that anchors do is anchors can keep you in a place of fruitfulness. Who, who wants their life to be fruitful? I want my life to be fruitful. I want my life to make a difference. Anchors can keep you in a place of fruitfulness. I went fishing uh, a couple of weekends ago with my eldest son, Caleb, and we went off Evan's head on a fishing charter. And what the guy would do is that he would, he, he took about, I mean, he, he took about four hours to get out there. It was a six hour trip. It took us about four hours to get out there. Uh, didn't want to get it out of first gear. Just put, 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 put. We got there eventually. When we get there, we, of course, we're in about 40 to 50 metres of water. So he says, rightio, bait up. So we bait up and we would drop the line down and the line would would, would go down and would hit the reef at the bottom and then as it would hit the reef you might get a bite or it might get caught in something anyway you'd, you'd pull it up anyone ever wound a line 50 meters on a hand on a on an egg beater just you're just there for about three or four minutes and then you get it up and there's nothing on there and you put a bit of bait on, you drop it down. Now this guy was doing this. He was watching us uh, wind up our line. I put a bait on, he would wait till I dropped it. And then as soon as it hit the bottom, he would do something every single time. And I swear, for some reason, he didn't like me. He did it deliberately. As soon as my line would hit the bottom, this guy would say, right, bring your lines up, we're going to move. I'm like, no, I have to wind again. Three, four minutes, he would wait till it's gone 50 metres down. It's like he's waiting, waiting. As soon as I hit the bottom and I clicked it, right, bring your lines up, now we're going to move. Again, he kept doing it all day to me because he didn't want to drop his anchor. So what he would do is he would, there was a reef here, so he would go over here and then he would turn off the engine and he'd say, drop your line. So we would float. And you would, you would, if you were lucky, you'd get your line down there on the reef where the fish were. If you were unlucky, it landed on the sand and it just dragged along the sand and there was nothing there in the sand. And then he would just say, right, bring your lines up again. We spent the whole day winding up going because he did not want to drop anchor. Last fishing charter I went on was up in Harvey Bay and me and my uncle cleaned up big time because what they did up there is they went to a reef, they dropped their anchor. So every time we dropped our line down, we knew 100% it's going to go down to the place where the fish are because fish love to hang around structure. Not a lot of fish like to hang out on open sand. So this guy dropped anchor and this fisherman, uh, this particular charter we went on, we absolutely cleaned up on fish. We filled an esky this big with fillets by the end of the day. Why? Because he dropped an anchor and he kept us in a place where our catch was going to be fruitful. He kept us in a place where we were going to be fruitful. This guy went out with the other day. He didn't keep us in a place of fruitfulness. And as a result of that, hardly anybody really caught any fish. We, we, we had six hours of fishing and hardly a fish was caught. So anchors can keep you in a place of safety. They can keep you in a place of fruitfulness. They can also keep you in a place of stability. Anchors can keep you in a place of stability. How many of you know stability is important in, in life? When I was in grade seven, I went to seven different high schools all around the state of New South Wales. My mother was a gypsy and I, not on a cart with a camel and a turban. She just couldn't stay still anywhere. And I, I had a year of my life with her and she just went from place to place to place. You know, in the midst of that instability, I lost my ability to make friends. I used to be a very personable sort of a person, but I gave up on trying to be friendly with people because you would meet someone, you would make a friend, and three weeks later my mother would take me somewhere and I would never get a chance to say goodbye, I would never get a chance to process their friendship, just gone. So by the end of it, I just decided no point making friends because they're just going to be gone tomorrow. I was a, a, believe this, this is true, I was a straight A student pretty much at school. I was the best reader, I was the best writer, I was the best at all that stuff when I was in grade six and the beginning of grade seven, I was a straight A. By the end of grade seven, I completely failed my HSC because I just got sick of trying to catch up, pick up. In the end, I gave up trying to learn because every school you go to was at a different place. The instability cost me a lot. Instability costs a lot. So we like stability. Anchors provide safety. They keep us in a place of fruitfulness and they keep us in a place of stability. Now, what has any of that got to do with what, what I'm talking about? Go with me to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. How many of you know that an anchor itself doesn't keep you safe? The anchor itself 
doesn't keep you stable. The anchor itself doesn't keep you in a place of fruitfulness. What does an anchor do? An anchor goes down to the bottom of the ocean and the anchor grabs to something. It hangs on to something. The anchor itself is not what keeps you safe. The anchor itself is not what keeps you in a place of fruitfulness. The anchor itself is not what provides the stability. You can drop an anchor and land on sand and you'll still drag. You'll still go nowhere. The anchor itself is not that which keeps you in that place. The anchor is the thing that grabs a hold of that which keeps you in that place. What is your life anchored to? What is your life anchored to? You know, I hear a lot of people say, my anchor is God. I don't think that's the Bible teaches that God is your anchor. From a Christian perspective, the Bible teaches us that God is our rock. God's the one that we attach the anchor to. He's not the anchor. He's the one that the anchor grabs onto in life. And if we attach our anchor to God, we can find ourselves in a place of stability. God wants to give us stability, particularly in our relationship with him. He doesn't want us playing, he loves me, he loves me not, he loves me, he loves me not, he loves me, he loves me not games with him. God wants to keep us in a place of fruitfulness. God's created us, fashioned us, put us down here for a purpose and a reason. He, he made you for a purpose. He's got things that you are perfect for throughout this short thing we call human existence, this tiny dot on the page that we call life. It's not long. I'm, I'm, I'm 48 years of age, and I, I know, shock horror, 48 years of age, and I cannot believe how fast that time has gone. You know what? In 11 days, it will be Christmas. I was just, we were just chatting the other day. I cannot believe how fast this year has gone. Anyone else feel like that? I feel like the older I get, the quicker life seems to go. Anyone else? When I was young and Christmas was one year and Christmas was a year away, it was like the end of planet Earth. It was the end of life itself. I was convinced I wouldn't make it to see another Christmas because it was that far away. Now I feel like I wake up on the 26th <laughs> and it's almost Christmas tomorrow. <laughs> I have a birthday and it's almost my birthday the next day. It's just going like that. Life is going so quick. What are we anchoring our life to? You know, some people anchor their world to politics and if we just get the political scene right, and we can have safety, stability, fruitfulness, peace, all those things that the human heart longs for. Some people, some people hang their hat on politics. That's what they, they drop the anchor down and the anchor goes on to, to the political scene. Some people think it's about a relationship. If I can just get the right relationship with the right person, that perfect person, you know, that perfect person who, who just thinks the sun shines out of my ears. That's the saying, isn't it? It's the PG version. The perfect person that, that, that just thinks I'm the bee's knees and, you know, what that really means is that perfect person that just accepts me as I am and I don't have to change or be anything else and, you know, that's beautiful. One thing I found though, when you do find that perfect person, you'll want to change, you'll want to adjust because you'll want to please that person. It won't just be about you, it'll become about that person if they're the right person. Some people put their anchor down in finances if I just have enough money. Some people drop their anchor on a career. If I could just get the right career and the right recognition, some people want to be famous. If I can just get popularity and fame. If everybody knows my name, maybe I can have the stability and the security. So I, I, I think about your world. What is, it that you're, what's, what is it that you drop your anchor onto? What is your anchor attached to? Or is your anchor attached to the true rock? Is it attached to God? Is your anchor attached to God? Hebrews chapter 6 tells us this. And, and, and just to give you a bit of background here, the writer of Hebrews is talking about Abraham. Now, Abraham in the Old Testament uh, had a promise made to him by God. And the promise was this, you will become the father of many nations. In other words, you and me, the church today, will birth way back there. God said, I'm going to use you and out of you is going to come this nation called Israel, which will evolve itself into the Christian church, which will eventually encompass people from every tribe, nation, tongue, language all over planet Earth. 
And, and God made this promise to him, and it said that Abraham received that promise because he was patient, he endured, he put up with stuff, and he got there. He made it. It wasn't easy, it wasn't a bed of roses, but he just kept believing. Even when he wasn't seeing it, he kept believing. Even when he wasn't feeling it, he kept believing. Even when it wasn't manifesting itself in front of him, he just kept believing and kept believing and kept believing and kept believing. How do you do that? How do you do that? I mean, so many people today, God, God, God doesn't answer a prayer and they want to run away from him. God doesn't heal somebody and they want to throw their faith in the towel in. They didn't get the result they wanted and they want to get mad at God and run away from God and blame God and say, God's this and God's that and so on. So in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 16 to 19, it says this, People swear by someone greater than themselves. And the oath confirms what he said and puts an end to all arguments. In other words, what he's saying is this. Back in those days, people would swear oaths. They would say a promise. That's why, remember when Jesus came on the scene, he said, from now on, let your yes be yes, your no be no. Anyone remember that passage? Yeah, Jesus is saying, once upon a time, you would say it and you would have to then swear on something greater than yourself, swear on something great and powerful. And, and, and if, I, if you swore on something great and powerful, then that oath was considered true. And so it's saying here that when God made the promise to Abraham, you're going to be a father of many nations, God could find no one other greater than himself, so God swore on himself. Anyone ever seen The Princess Bride? One of my favourite movies. If you haven't seen it, get saved to go and see it. The Princess Bride, it's a great movie. There's a scene in there, remember the scene where our hero is climbing to the top of the mountain and there's the, the three guys at the top that are, that are, um, are, are, are going to kill him. Remember the really smart guy and then there's big Andre the Giant and there's the, 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 the guy with the sword. Anyone remember that scene? And there, he's climbing up the rope. And, and, and Andre the Giant and the really smart guy have run off further down the trail. And the guy with the sword's at the top. And he's saying, he's saying to the guy, can you, you know, he's, he's Spanish, he's French, whatever, so he's got an accent. Can you hurry up? You know, I can't wait you all day. I must catch you with my friends. I'm just waiting here to kill you. And the guy's like, can you, if you leave me alone, I'll, I'll climb a lot faster. Let me focus on what Anyway, he gets up towards the top and he can't quite get up the top. And then he's worried about getting up the top because, of course, there's a guy waiting with a sword. So as you're climbing up, ah, it's all over. And so the guy says to him, he says, I'll, I'll, I'll help you. I'll, I'll, I'll step back and I'll help you get to the top. And the guy climbing, of course, goes, uh, how, how can I trust that you're, you're waiting to kill me? Why would you let me get to the top? And he says, I, I swear to you, I'll let you get to the top. And the guy that's climbing goes, I do not believe you. And so he leans over and he says this. He says, I swear on the soul of my father, I think it's Inigo Montoya, Oh, so let me do. I swear on the soul of my father, in Nicomantoya, you will reach the top of life. And that settled it. He went, okay, and he climbed up and it was all settled. So when they swear on something greater than themselves, it's just basically a way of saying, what I'm saying to you right now is 100% true. And, and God said to Abraham something was going to happen and it was 100% true. It says, because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. Verse 18, God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie. Verse 19, it says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul. What's the anchor for the soul? What's the hope that we have as an anchor? Let me cut a long story short. The hope that we have for an anchor is that God cannot lie. God has an unchanging nature about him. There's something about God that doesn't allow him to tell you something or tell us something that's not true. In other words, anything that God says is 100% true because of the person who said it, not because of the words, but because of the one who said it. Because God said it, those words become true. The anchor that he's talking about here for our soul is this. It's faith and trust in the character and nature of God, not the actions and activities of God. So many people have their anchor attached to God, but the anchor is what God does. And as long as God does what they want, what they want God to do, then they love God, they praise God, they worship God, they're excited about God and so on, because it's all about the deeds of God and the activities of God. What, what, what the writer of Hebrews is talking about here, he's writing to a bunch of people that are thinking about quitting their faith. He's writing, or he or she, they don't know who wrote this book, they're writing to a bunch of people who have come from a Jewish background, who are all the Old Testament rituals and so on, who have decided to follow Jesus and realised, came to the same conclusion that many of you in this room have come to, you know what, it's not as easy as it sounded. It's tough. It's hard. 
It doesn't always go our way. We don't always get, get, get the, the, the answer we wanted. We don't always get the healing. We don't always get the provision. We don't always get everything that was in the brochure. You know, how many of you came to faith and you were told that story? When you come to Jesus, it'll be a bed of roses and everything will be great and you will never have any pain, never have any troubles anymore. I heard that stuff. First time I ever started hearing about Jesus, that was the story. Come to Jesus, life will be perfect. Guess what? It's not. It's not. But you know what happens when people are fed that and when people believe that? When you make your anchor line, the rope that holds the anchor, if that rope is what God does, you're going to be bitterly disappointed in this life. And there are many people in 2020, I think, that have been bitterly disappointed with God because 2020 didn't look like the way they thought it was. That great prophetic word that came. Remember, everyone know January, 20, January 1st, everyone gets an amazing prophetic word from God. Has anyone noticed that? Everybody gets an amazing word. Oh, God said this year's going to be like that. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. I don't know. I think God speaks as well uh, on November 7 as he does January 1. I don't think there's a set day. Not that I'm against having a goal and God said, great, if God does, he does. But here's the point. The point is that 2020 didn't go the way that a lot of people thought it was going to go. And there's a lot of stuff happening in your world right now that's not going the way you think it should go. And if your anchor that's attached to God is purely what God does for you, then that anchor rope will be cut. That anchor rope will snap eventually and you will drift away. Because you think that, that our faith is rooted in what God does. The Christian faith is not rooted in what God does. It's rooted in what God did 2,000 years ago. But our faith lends and leans upon the character and nature of God, not His activities. God's activities will change day to day. His nature and character will never change. And you've got situations in your world right now. Can you look at those situations? Can you look at those moments of disappointment, those moments of hurt? Can you look at the things that are not going your way right now? I've got things in my life that are not going my way right now. Lots of things that aren't going my way. And what I've got to do is get a chair and, and sit opposite them and say to myself, can I look those things in the eye and can I still say, you know what, even though you don't look like the way I want you to look, guess what? God is good. God is just. God is faithful. God is trusting. Trustworthy. God is all the things that this word tells me that he is. And my faith rests in the character and nature of God, not his activity. So even though the activities are not what I want, my faith is not wavering. My faith is not tipping. I'm not thinking about throwing God out the window because God never promised that he would do, 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 do. He promised to me he would be, 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 be. God promised he would be. He would be faithful to me. He would be committed to me. He promised that everything that happens in my world is going to work out for my good. Whether it feels good right now or not, it's going to work out for good. That's faith. That's faith. And that's the anchor that the writer is talking about here. And any other kind of rope that's holding your anchor on that rock, if there's anything else other than the character and nature of God, you are setting yourself up for disappointment and failure. Why did that person get healed and not that person? I don't know. I was 21 years of age when I went over to India. 21 years of age. I've been saved since I was 19. Came to faith at 19. 21. I'm over in India. I'm working in a mission agency, youth with a mission like these guys. And I'm over there and I'm doing the work and I'm preaching in villages every day. We're seeing people come to faith. I'm literally praying for people and seeing miracles. Nearly every day I'm seeing miracles. Guys that have been bedridden for years are getting up. And I'm looking at my hand going, wow, that's awesome. But it's not me, it's God. We saw people that walk up like this, you pray for them, they get up and they walk away. People that couldn't see properly, pray for them and they're getting sight back. And I'm just there going, wow, this God, this God stuff's pretty awesome. This is great. One day I sat down with a friend of mine and we asked, we had a conversation and we talked about all these amazing things that we were seeing happen. And we asked ourselves this question, I'm 21 I'm, 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 and I've only been following Jesus for a couple of years. This kind of stuff could really mess me up, make me think, I'm something awesome and get all proud and arrogant. And he said the same thing. He was a lovely guy, American guy, said the same thing. So we prayed this prayer. We said, God, here's the deal. If our character is not at the right place to deal with that, we want you to, 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 to stop it. Would you, would you do that for us, God? Would you do that? You know what happened the very next day? From that moment on, went out there, we prayed for sick people. Guess what? Did not see a single healing. It was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. <laughs> When, and, and, we, and we pray for people and, and nothing would happen. And so we'd say the Christian thing, we'll just believe in faith as you walk away, God's going to... And that's great. I still do that today. I still believe we should do that. But that was not our story at the time. Our story was we were seeing it happen like that. It was amazing. And then all of a sudden, nothing's happening. Well, you know what happened? 
I used to have these little bunch of Indian kids and I used to go downtown on my motorbike and I would park my motorbike in. And when I would park my motorbike, I, they, I, they would come with their rags in it and they would polish my motorbike and clean it. You know? And I used to give them uh, money. They were like security guards, these little street kids. And I'd give them money. And then I found out one day that they'd take the money home to Dad. Dad would spend the money on alcohol and drink himself stupid and beat the kids. But I still wanted to bless the kids, so I stopped giving them money. So what I started doing was, okay, I'd take them into the shops and I'd buy them sandals and things like that. And then I found out that they'd go home, Dad would take the sandals and sell them and so on. So in the end, I decided, here's what you're going to do. You watch my motorbike, and when I come back from my shopping, so I'm going to take all these kids. And, the, and the, the group just kept getting bigger and bigger. And I ended up taking these kids across the road to a little ice cream shop called Dinshaw's, and we sat on the steps of a Dinshaw's, and I bought them all an ice cream because Dad couldn't take that ice cream off them. And for a moment, I got to watch these kids be kids. And, and to be honest with you, even in the midst of all the healings and miracles and stuff we saw, that was the highlight of my time over there. I couldn't wait to go downtown, do my shopping and get these little kids and be able to just sit down and have an ice cream with these kids and watch kids be kids. One day, after I prayed and said, God, if I'm not ready for this, stop it. I went downtown one day and get my groceries and they're watching my bike and we go and sit down and buy them an ice cream. They're sitting there and they're laughing at me because I'm not really fluent in Hindi and Marathi and I'm laughing at them because they're not fluent in English. But one day I looked at them and this thought popped into my head. God can't be that good. Why would God let this beautiful little kid be born to an alcoholic father in an impoverished nation like India? Can't be as good as you think he is. And that was all I needed, the seed. Over the coming months, every day I would drive on in there and I'd see these kids and I played with that thought. I let that thought fester and it grew and it grew and it grew. Before you know, everywhere I went in India, I would look and instead of seeing the, the beauty of what God was able to do, instead of seeing somebody taken from bondage into freedom, what I started seeing everywhere was accusations against the goodness of God. God, you're actually not that good. That woman over there, God, she didn't want to be married to that man. That this, this kid over here, God. Why has this village got no war? And I started getting angry at God. Cut a long story short, I jumped on a bus. I did a three-day bus journey up through the middle of India, three days. Got dysentery on the way, should have told me something. Three days up the middle of India, I got out in Nepal, jumped into a plane and flew back to Australia. I didn't even tell anybody I worked with or the organisation I was a part of. I just disappeared. Disappeared. Landed at Brisbane Airport. A friend picked me up, took me to his house. Next day, drove me back down to Balanda where my life began. I spent three days walking up and down the back lanes just behind River Street. I can't remember the laneways there. From one end to the other with headphones on, pumping into me all the most evil, darkest music you could possibly think of. I stopped at Bangkok Airport on the way and I went out and I bought all these bands. And what I did is I read the lyrics and I, I deliberately tried to find... This is back when... Remember Walkmans? You know, I remember a Walkman, a cassette Walkman? Yeah? I'll explain it to you later, Liam. Um, <laughs> that music your dad listens to you used to go into one of those. Walkman. And so I got all these lyrics and I looked for lyrics and what I deliberately looked for was all the sort of stuff that I thought God would hate because I wanted him to hate me as much as I'd learned to hate him. Here I am, I'm a missionary, I'm out there in the other side of the world telling people about Jesus and I hate God that much that I'm trying to find reasons to make him hate me. And I'm walking up and down the laneway, walking up and down the laneway. You can jump up if you want, Daniel, for me. I'm going to finish up. I'm walking up and down the laneway. And I'm, 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 I'm wanting God to hate me. And the weirdest thing is this, I knew that God was with me. Don't ask me to explain to you how. I'm not, a, you know, I'm not, not somebody that has all these you know, weird and wonderful angelic visions and feelings and stuff, but something happened. God was to the left of me, about one step to the side of me, two steps behind me, and he was walking with me and he wouldn't leave me alone for three days. And it made me angry. I got more and more angry at God. I, I remember walking. I must have looked like some kind of psycho because I'm walking along with my walkman and I'd stop. And every time I would stop, I would envision God walking. He would stop and he would fold his arms. Don't ask me how I know that. I just know that's what he did. He folded his arms and he stood there. And I'm calling over my left shoulder, leave me alone. I hate you. I must have looked like a whacker. Three days this went on. Finally, a friend of mine in Brisbane got wind that I'd disappeared from India. He chased me down, drove down here to Balna. Wanted to take me out for lunch. I went out for lunch. We sat down. We had a bit of a chat. Nothing great. But as we began to talk, I began to weep. Something cracked inside of me and I started bawling like a baby. And I just said to him, this sucks. This isn't fair. God's, God's not... You, you know, Billy Crystal's favourite line, this was not in the brochure. 
That was basically my cry. What, what I was brought up with, what I, what I came into this Christian faith believing, that one plus two equals three, that if you do this, God will do You know, our bookstores are full of it. The five steps to prosperity, the three ways to divine healing, the seven steps to divine this. And, and, and you know what? Let me tell you something. I've learned something. God, God works with me individually and I haven't found a system that works, period. There's only one system in the Bible. Matthew, I think it's Matthew 4, 19. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. That's about as close as I can get to some kind of system. You follow me and I'll turn you into what I want you to do. And I'll make you the person you want to be. Just follow me. That's it. It's that simple. And I sat there and I wept and I bawled and I bawled like a baby. And on that moment, sitting on that jetty overlooking the river, God spoke to me. And I, 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 I want to share this scripture that he gave me. Psalm 103 verse 7. Here's what God said to me. What God was doing was saying, Alan, here's your anchor. Don't ever forget this. Here's your anchor. Psalm 103 verse 7. It says, He made known his ways, speaking of God. God made known his ways to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. Anyone that knows the Old Testament knows the story of Israel. God comes there in Egypt. God gets them out of Egypt. Miraculously. I mean, the plagues that run through that place. These guys that have been in slavery for hundreds of years, they walk out holding golden trinkets and Nintendos and Playstations and Wiis. <laughs> and they're carrying them out. Don't know where they're going to take them. There's no power out there. But anyway, they're taking them out there. The Egyptian armies chase them. God parts the water. Can you imagine being one of those guys, a couple of million people standing there watching an ocean literally part, walking across on dry land and then turning around over your shoulder and seeing the enemies chasing you, freaking out, and then all of a sudden God pulls his hand back and the water goes over them. Can you imagine experiencing that? Then they're wandering around, don't know where they're going. So what does God do during the day? He appears as a cloud. Like there's a literal cloud in front of you. Not like today. It's there. Nighttime, what do they do? He appears like a flaming fire. God's presence is so evident. There's this fire there leading them around. He's giving them water. They're not having to work for it. He's giving them water. He drops manna from heaven, this, this food, this stuff. I mean, what more do you want? And then what did they do when things didn't go their way? They would turn around. And at one point they even said to Moses, you and God brought us out here to kill us, didn't you? And we hate this bread stuff that you're feeding us. See, when God was doing what Israel wanted, they loved him. They were high-fiving. When God didn't do what they thought he should do, what did they do? They threw the towel in of their faith. They weren't that interested. You see, their anchor was the activities and deeds of God. That's why their relationship with God was like this. Let me tell you something. You'll never have stability in your relationship with God if you're constantly like this. You'll never experience the safety that comes from being secure in the hand of God like this. You'll never have a fruitful life in God if you're like this. Israel anchored themselves on the deeds and activities of God, but it says Moses knew the ways of God. In other words, Moses knew the character of God. And it's the character of God that we need to anchor ourselves to the rock with. Put your faith in the character and nature of God. Don't put your faith in the activities and deeds of God. Some people in this room right now, I guarantee you, are disappointed. I, I know this because I, I wasn't going to speak on this. I felt like the Holy Spirit said, there are people here today and you're disappointed. You're disappointed because God's not doing what you thought he would do. Or he's not doing it the way you thought he would do it. Or the way you think he should do it. And as a result of that, because you're so fixed on the activity and you're not getting the result, you're questioning. You're a bit like the disciples on the boat when Jesus said, let's go to the other side. And they jump in and the storm hits. And what does it say in Mark 4? Jesus has got a cushion under his head. He's having a nap in the middle of a storm and they're freaking out. And they kick him and wake him up and they say, don't you care that we're perishing? Don't you care? In other words, our faith is in the deeds of God and you're not doing what we think that, we, that you should be doing. And because you're not doing what we think you should be doing, that tells us you don't care about us. Jesus wakes up, calms the storm and then says, you know what, you should have just put your head on a pillow next to me. Because my nature doesn't change and my purposes don't change. I told you we're going to the other side. Where's your anchor? Where's your anchor? Is he in the deeds and activities of God 
or you anchored in the character and the nature of God. We're going to finish up now. We've gone a little bit longer than we normally do this morning. It's 10 coffee next door. But here's what I want to do. I feel like there are some people here and, and, and we want to pray for you. I feel like God said there are some people here and you're struggling. What I'm speaking today, you don't have to, don't sit there now and go, I wonder if it's, no, you know it's you. As I've been speaking, the Holy Spirit's been talking to you and you know that's you. And, and I want to pray for you. Get Jackie and some of the leaders to come and pray with you today. Because I believe God's saying it's time for you to drop your anchor. If you don't drop your anchor, you're going to drift to a point where you're going to become another shipwreck. It's time to drop your anchor. Put your faith in the character and nature of God. Look at those things and start saying, start declaring, you know what, God is still good. God is still faithful. God is still trustworthy, even though it doesn't look like it. Because my faith's not in what God does. My faith is in the character and nature of my Father. Here's the thing. If you don't think God's got a good character, then you're kidding yourself to think you trust anything he has to say. Because if you don't trust a person's character, you don't trust their words. You never will. But if you do trust someone's character, you'll trust their words even if you don't understand them. Because it's the character that makes the difference. Amen. Father, I want to thank you for this morning, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to gather together again. Lord, it's a bit of a different morning, a little bit weirder than normal, but I guess what's normal? So, Father, we want to thank you for your presence with us. Lord, I pray right now, God, those people that you've been speaking to in this place, that, uh, Father, you would give them the courage and the boldness, Lord, not just to walk away, but, Father, to, to come forward this morning, Lord, to receive prayer. God, to allow the Holy Spirit to minister uh, to them, Lord. And God, I pray for every person in this room, Father. God, there are some people here that are walking with you. God, there are some people here that are walking towards you. God, there are some people here that are probably walking away from you, Father. It doesn't matter, Lord. What matters is you're here right now and you love each and every person at whatever stage of the journey they're on. And my prayer for each person here, God, is reveal yourself to them in a way that they would understand, in a way that they would see and know, wow, that must be God. And Lord, as we leave this place, as we go from this place this morning, God, in the next seven days, would you give us, everyone here that knows you, God, give us an opportunity to tell somebody out there who you are, God, to tell somebody out there that doesn't know, that's struggling, to let them know that they're special to you and that you love them and that you died for them 2,000 years ago so they could be free. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.